Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri. Today we're going to talk about why you need a research team. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cost-effective way to do this without having to generate an entire team, but it will take time and resources to kind of integrate the research in this process. But we're going to really get into why it is a critical part of the quantitative finance community within banking, investment firms, um, financial technology, any sorts of firms that are related to quantitative finance. So there are three main advantages of having a research team on why you need them here. And they're all kind of tied together. Uh, but the first one is going to be a competitive advantage. And what I mean by this is that we all make money from some sort of modeling advantage here. Now, this is often challenging when you're on the business side because you see things from a very large perspective here, right? Um, if you're at a bank, uh, you make loans, you engineer products, those products end up getting packaged, secured, as often sold off to some sort of investment company. Um, and then you service all those loans typically internally and there are entire operations teams that worry about losses and fraud and modeling and all these other pieces that come together. And so you see this as a very big picture, but often you don't stop to think about like, where is our advantage coming from on the pricing side of this? And pricing, losses, fraud, operations, all these sorts of efficiencies of themselves are going to come from some sort of competitive advantage here. So I'll give you a quick example of this. Back in the day, back in my early careers, um, PD modeling was predominantly, so probability of default modeling for loans was predominantly done uh, by logistic regression. So it handles values between zero and one, it generates a probability in that range. Um, you can bring in a variety of different variables, you can do weight of evidence spinning, there's a bunch of stuff you can do with it, uh, and you can create a PD model for that. As machine learning became more and more popular, and yes, historically it was used a lot, uh, decision tree based models and things like Angos, uh, back in fraud modeling, but as things were needed to be explainable, there was this trial period that was going through this process here. And I'll give an example of how this somewhat failed. So they brought in a model development team and they hired in some people to do some decision tree XG boost types of models, bring in some machine learning. Um, we're gonna model all this and make it explainable and you know hand wavy stuff. So they brought in a bunch of new people. They had some old people experimenting with it. Uh, and I worked on the model validation team, so I got to see from the top down like what was happening, who was building things. And then I went through and I failed every model that we had to some point. There were a few that got through towards the end. They finally got to a standard of use case of where it could be used. But we failed a lot of these models because it was just a bunch of junior newbies that we were bringing in. Um, there wasn't a lot of overlap and expertise within the finance and the ML space at that point in time. And so you had people on the newer technology side being on the ML side, data science side, just throwing mud at the wall and hoping something stuck. Um, and then you had finance side and like validation teams like myself going through being like, well, these are gonna fail fairly quickly and here's exactly why. And also you can't do this because of these regulations um, and the models actually aren't going to work in practice. And here's like a use case on how we know this is gonna happen and going through the process. So it's easy to see how this wasn't going to work, but a ton of time and effort was just wasted on bringing in new talent. And one of the fail points for this was they didn't have a research team. There wasn't a team that was coming in saying, hey, um, we understand that you have this problem. We're gonna bring in some newer research. We understand the business of finance and quantitative finance, whatever business side you're in, uh, in the actual product itself. And then understanding, again, current methodologies, so statistics and math, and then understanding whatever your newer thing is, whether it's an LLM, whether it's you know XGBoost back in the day, um, where you're trying to apply these to the problems here. You need to be an expert in all these areas, and really to do this, you need to have a good solid chunk of time just to do research. Not to solve a problem, because when you solve a problem, you have a deadline, and it's almost like you have a gun to your head, like you're trying to frantically get this solved and out the door. Uh, and teams will often cut corners because they're not a research team. So that is an example of this uh, going awry in a big firm. You're wasting a lot of time and money um, to do this. I've seen companies bring in vendors as well. I have failed and thrown out many, many vendor tools and products over the years. So someone got excited. They bought the vendor tool. I didn't get to look at it till later. Told them it's complete crap. Um, and we had stuck paying tons of money for products that we just never used um, at a variety of different firms. So it's a big waste of time on that. Also the competitive advantage point with this is that you need to find something that's new and cutting edge um, to get some sort of advantage to run your business. Like this is how you generate profit. So I can tell you on the banking side, for example, um, the goal of often like loan pricing is the example I've been using here. Um, if you can get that price a little bit tighter, but more specifically, if you can figure out which customers will not default, you can give them a much, much lower price because you're not gonna have losses to absorb on that. 
So you can get that a lot lower. Um, and then on the flip side, if you can figure out who's going to default uh, with much greater certainty, you can charge a higher premium because you're trying to avoid those sorts of loans. And then there's segmentation of creating these and doing a bunch of work behind the scenes. This is an advantage. Uh, on the investing side, you have the same kind of scenario here. You're trying to generate some sort of return, whether it's a prop fund, some proprietary internal funds you're trying to maximize, whether you have clients, um, whether you're building them like a product, like an ETF or something else. You're trying to maximize some sort of problem. You're trying to solve some sort of solution and get a better advantage or a better product out the door with your modeling. And so returns is an example of investments. How do you get a better return? You do better portfolio optimization and you have better trading strategies and you have better execution and cost minimization techniques and models behind all of this. So having some sort of advantage or edge or tool, and as I talked about here, we looked at things like ML and AI. Um, there are other things and products that I'm working on in my background and things I've thought about. Um, to give you an example of this, again, on the banking side, research I did that got thrown out and I'm sure does not exist within the firms. I, I doubt it. I think a lot of these documents and things that were created um, were never used. Um, one of them was using a neural network to do actual loan pricing. So one of the hardest parts with loan pricing and PD models, um, often people reframe it as PD, probability of default zero one. Loans have multi-states. And so in pricing, when you get into the pricing framework, so this outside of PD, um, you want to know, is it going to pay off early? So prepayment, is it going to pay in full on time? Um, is it going to be lagging behind and then rolling forward and then being behind and then lagging? There are things called roll rate models for this as well. And then you also have the state of like charge off and when is it going to charge off and what is the timing of these cash flows? And you have all these pieces coming together. There are methods that are used like survival analysis and that's okay. But there are better ways you could do this with a neural network. And a neural network can have multiple nodes at the end here. So imagine you have um, your outputs, like you have, you know, prepay. Um, let's just say you have full payment. And let's just say you have default. You could have multiple states, as I mentioned, like roles and all that. Um, and then you would have uh, your, your variables going in. I don't know how many you have with this. And you'd want to create a simplistic neural network to minimize this work um, down so that you could actually have more explainability within the framework. Um, but let's just say you have you have some sort of neural network here. And so we have this neural network and essentially you could get um, multi-state outputs. So there's a lot of interesting respects to this. As many of you know, I focus a lot on the explainability piece. There are really cool things you can do with this and taking the networks apart and looking at the functionality and how these work within a banking structure. This is an excellent example of how this failed. Um, another one on the cutting edge piece of this, which was years and years and years ago. I saw recently there's an article talking about using images within time series forecasting. I have a bunch of issues with that. You would need video to do forecasting within time series to look at the evolutions of the the images, um, but you can use neural networks again um, to do image processing. But imagine you had some sort of grid that you would design, like in the customer's example on pricing, um, and it would have essentially just different colored pixels. So like this pixel, you know, might be pink and this one might be pink. And, you know, you might have like a green one here. And I don't know, you have some blue ones or something else. But you would create some sort of picture imaging process. And one way to actually do this in a human spectrum is sorting and organizing the pixels in the imagery so that it looks like more something logical from a human stance. So thinking about like a gradient, like imagine you had, you know, like, like these were like supposed to be blue and then you had your greens and these kind of shaded in as we talked about, um, to some sort of point. Um, and then you had your imaging where you had some sort of pink here. Anyways, you would create these sorts of images. And as you price customers, the different variables would go through, um, and impact how the image looked. And it would go through some sort of network like this. And this network would generate images. And then you could classify these images. So when a consumer looks like something very specific, these weird images that are generated, what would come out of this was that you would say, oh, this customer looks like they're going to default. And given these pricings and the structure and the design, um, again, but this, this image, what this is interpreted as is a multidimensional space of thousands of variables that we start from, like three, 4,000 variables, and we narrow it down and get into some sort of model and structure like this neural network over here. And then in the neural network, that takes those sorts of relationships and it looks at the combinations of these relationships um, and does some sort of computation, again, with these layerings and treat as like the network design and a bunch of things um, and how you get to this process and it could output some sort of complex um, space 
Um, and then there can be some sort of extra layering or process that goes on to how the images look. That's like the sorting process to getting to these images. Could be used for loan pricing, could be used for all kinds of things. Um, but these sorts of ideas give you some sort of competitive advantage in this space. NNS is nonlinear, non-parametric statistics. I've been talking about this over and over again. Um, you can use it for like portfolio optimization um, as a more generalized approach to mean variance, but with a lot more explainable pieces and realistic assumptions behind the model itself to get into that as well. But it gives you a competitive advantage in the business to actually make money. Now, the second part of this is going to be employee development and retainment. So it is often hard to convince management to put a bunch of money in to having a research team. And even if you can do that, one of the hardest pieces is if you have a research team that's cutting edge and moving forward, how do you feed that information back into your model development teams? That's a challenge. Um, you can set it up that way and have two separate teams and then you can have training. So there's always going to, have to be some sort of training and cross training going on between that framework. Um, if you're on the banking side, the sell side, and you have a, uh, a validation team as well, you have to loop techno technologically all these parties into this so everybody is growing as a team um, and getting you know value out of this. Uh, the other approach to this is just doing one model development slash validation team, depending how you break these out, um, and then having rotational periods of research or research as a mandatory process or part um, of that. So not every employee has to have a new cutting edge idea. You can have an employer or manager that comes in with an idea. Um, so employees spend some time and they work on this. Why this is different than typical model development and why I see teams doing this is you need to have teams doing the daily business for so many months, right? Doing projects, you're heavily involved in a quant, thinking through complex problems and trying to solve them. You don't want to be distracted with research projects and other projects and fire drills and everything else. Um, and then you'll have a block or a period. Like you'd say, okay, three months out of the year, we're going to have a rotational three months research process, which I've tried to do with teams I've I've ran before. Um, the business always gets in the way of these things, but you have this where they're working basically nine months of the year. And let's say the first rotation is January through March. You have employees working on that project, trying to generate a final product within a three month period of doing the research and outputting it. Then the second rotation you'd have is like another three month period where you'd have second group of them, third group, fourth group based on the quarters, or you might just have a few rotations because your team's not small, not big enough to really do a full rotation. The advantage of doing this approach though is that your development team is getting the actual research and insights because they're doing the research, which is much more insightful. Um, and then they can kind of train the people around them as their process goes and they can get put onto newer projects and help innovate and drive that. There's still gonna be some cross educational pieces that need to occur here. So that needs to be thought about. And then also you have employee retention. So one thing that blows companies' minds that are not quants themselves is I've seen companies that like throw money at someone and they do really well and they throw more money at them and they do really well and they keep getting more money. And then all of a sudden the employee just leaves and the company is like baffled. They go, this is one of our best employees. We paid him a bunch of money. And then they left and they said the work got like mundane or boring or whatever. And so they moved on. And they're like, no, 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 but you were doing such a good job at your job. And it's like, yes, they were. But many quants, including myself, we want to learn and grow. And, you know, it's there's always so much buzz and hype on the internet as well. So it's hard, even on LinkedIn, you see like, oh, everybody's doing something new. And, you know, like there's just like you're chasing the trends and you don't want to chase the trends. You want to spend quality time doing research so you're not wasting resources and you want something valuable to come out of that. Um, but re employee retention will actually increase and you'll keep your better employees longer um, and more people will want to come to work for you, which makes actually the cost of finding new employees much cheaper. So there's an advantage in that point as well. And then three is going to be solving new problems. So with new technology comes new problems to be solved. Um, and to give you an example, that's something that we all can kind of relate with is, you know, when you have a check and you need to deposit the check, but you don't want to drive to the bank. So you grab your phone uh, and you go into your app and then you click the picture uh, and you end up taking a picture and it has your signature and everything and it gets validated and checked and the check is deposited. There's image recognition that goes into that. Imagine now before the ability to do image recognition, like the problem of saying, hey, we want customers to be able to deposit a check on their phone was not even a thought in anyone's mind, right? It was a new problem that no one knew that could be solved. So no one is even thinking about it or looking at it. As new technologies come up, often you look at things, and you're like, wow, we can provide a new service, a new product. 
Um, maybe there are old pro uh, problems that you've looked at and you're like, there's no possible way to do this besides doing like a rule-based approach. Like if this, then that. Um, and you set up these simple, simple solutions on that. As new technology comes about though, you can solve these things faster and easier. A lot of this has occurred when you look at the stock exchanges, for example, like way back in the day um, through the digital era now where everything is done through servers and processing and computers with this. Um, it has changed drastically based on just that sort of technology that we have there. Uh, so these sorts of advantages will come to your firm often through operational efficiencies, which I think a lot of companies miss. So the top one's gonna be competitive advantage, typically like in your core business. Um, and then as you kind of step back, you look at things like how do we process paperwork faster? How do we execute um, quality controlled checks or data quality cleaning and these sorts of processes in a controlled responsible manner, but simplify this framework and process here? How do we do that? Uh, again, these sorts of technologies will help advance this, but you need a research team that knows the business to do the research, to come up with these sort of solutions to help increase the efficiency, solve new problems, and retain employees. Now, I will put a warning at the end of this, right? Everything I'm telling you sounds very logical. Like, of course you need a research team. Why don't companies just do research teams? Um, the biggest one is going to be uh, waste. So a lot of research teams I've seen, you get people that are involved, they're excited, they have crazy off-the-wall ideas that are not related to the business or don't have a way to even have an inkling of how you would tie that to the business. Um, and so they just waste time and money. And so management comes back through this and they go, wow, we have this team, it's three, four, five million dollars a year to run this, it's not very efficient. That's why if you embed in your development teams, often you can kind of hide the cost of this. And I wouldn't say this is like you're trying to dupe management. You need to explain to them the process and all these advantages. Um, but it's much harder for them to track it. So often they don't just take a line item and go, oh, the research team cost us $4 million last year. If we just cut that, we'll save a bunch of money. Um, and there is a ton of money and time and resources just wasted on stupid projects, like wasteful things with employees that aren't qualified to be doing research, um, chasing avenues that aren't beneficial. But this is very much like risk management um, and the way they teach it in corporate finance. So in corporate finance, you take risk management class. They talk about one of the hardest things with risk management is going to be um, the actual value add in the two scenario outcomes. So imagine you're going to hedge something like, I don't know, the cost of oil. And so you can either buy a derivative product to help hedge the cost. So if the price goes up on that, uh, you're not going to take a loss. It'll be balanced out and you'll save a bunch of money. And then you have the case where you buy the derivative product. And if the price of oil stays the same or goes down, you don't execute that sort of derivative contract or the option here. Um, and then you end up losing the cost to purchase that option originally, right? You have two outcomes. Uh, if you choose to buy the derivative product and the market goes to crap, right? And it's prices are rising, you're going to look like a hero. But if you bought that derivative product and prices stayed the same or went down, you're gonna look like a loser and like we wasted a bunch of time and money. It's hard to incorporate and think about the risk management perspective of like, you know, there was a scenario we did dodge or we avoided or we hedged against. And the flip side of that is if you buy nothing, you don't spend any money, you don't take any time or resources to buy these sorts of option products in this example, and nothing goes bad, prices stay the same or grow down or up a little tiny bit, you know, you look like a hero, but no one's really gonna pat you on the back for that because you're just doing your job as usual. Um, but if the market goes and the prices skyrocket and all of a sudden your business, the costs are out of control and you're really struggling to keep it together, now your risk team is gonna look awful and they're gonna say, these people screwed us. They didn't do really good risk management. They should have bought those options to hedge our risk. Um, but again, it's that, that balance here. This is quantitative research in itself as well, uh, and just research in general, so it doesn't need to just be quantitative and modeling based, but you know, when you get good advantages from it and when you make good progress, you get good wins, everyone's excited. Sometimes though they slide under the radar, like, oh, we built a model and the model priced out losses or the model optimized that portfolio. Uh, and yeah, we're doing pretty good. We're doing better than usual. But nobody stops to thinking, oh, wow, it was because of this new marketing, you know, model that we had. You know, you need to market that and talk about like, you know, this person was a great, you know, asset this year and they really made a difference and they had this new methodology, uh, right? Those are things don't sort of happen in that process here. So that's why I'm going to just give you this warning here at the end. You really need a lot of support. You need a lot of education, understanding of how and why research can help you. And then you also need someone to lead your research efforts and focus them on projects that are meaningful that could enhance and improve the business itself. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.